Okay, we have time for three more questions. I have a question. Uh, and we'll have to wrap it. I know you worked with Jackie Gleason. Was wondering if you had any interesting stories about working with him. Yeah, I did, and wonderful stories. Um, and that was, once again, I go back to Milbert Christopher. Had it not been for Milbert Christopher, I would have never worked with Jackie Gleason. He was so kind to us. And uh, as a matter of fact, when Chris called and said, you want to be the Gleason charts, are you, you, are you kidding me? You know, what, what will we, let's get there. So my wife and I, we went up at Bish. We went up to uh, Maureen and Chris's house and in their apartment, and we rehearsed the shows there. And I had never done, I mean, I did the substitution trunk. I did a few little things. And when I walked into Chris's apartment, and he said, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this. And I had never seen any of half of this stuff before, you know. Uh, we had what they called the hernia maker, which was the sawing the girl in half, because uh, you know Thurston used to, Raise, put a ca uh, swing down or a, a camp, not a camp, but a, something to pick her up a with, a hammock, a hammock to pick her up and load her into the thing. But we had to pick her up from the end of the, of the installing. So it was like, oh, there she is. Now she's down on the inside. And uh, so we went to do the Gleason show and we got there first rap on the door was, is Goebel in there? I said, yes, sir. This is the dressing room. He said, came in, he said, uh, you haven't paid any after dues. I said, well, I've never been on, you know, I've never been on television before. He said, don't tell me you're on a network show and never, it never this is the first time and you're on the Gleason show? I said, yeah. I said, a friend of mine, Mr. Christopher, asked me to come here. And I said, so well, you get by with it once, but I, I'll get you the next time, go. So I said, okay. So the thing was, we were rehearsing the show. It went well. Jackie Gleason was there, and he had a, a double that went through and did a lot of this stuff for him. And he went through Chris's um, mummy case. And Chris had some, they were like plastic casters on the bottom. And so, when this man stepped through, the casters cracked. Now, if you remember, the shows were live. They were not, you know, taped and then done later on. So, and the stagehands, if people tell you about stagehands in New York, to me, they were phenomenal. They were absolutely wonderful. And uh, they would just pick up the stuff and move it over to stage right or stage left and put it where it was. Well, they did that with a mummy case. And this was a live show, and I don't know if it was Sammy Spears or somebody, they're playing the music and everything, and we're ready to do the mummy case. They go to roll it, the thing goes boop, boop, boop. The uh, casters broke. And so Lon Masterson, who was a stagehand there, who was also a magician, he and the other stagehands picked up the mummy case with the girl on the inside, duct tape the uh, it, uh, casters together, brought them over, set it down in place. And when Mr. Gleason came by, he said, I opened the front door, Bishop opened the back door. And I said to him, sir, don't go through, it's broken. Or I didn't say that, I just said, it's broken. And so he said, well, you step through there, my little man. And Bish went through that quick. That's how quick he was. He was absolutely wonderful, yeah. and. Uh, he just sat outside and watched the show until the, the actual show. He sat in the, in the audience. But he always sent all the ladies roses before the show. And um, there was something else I wanted to tell you. I forget what it was. Bill was absolutely right when he said he wrote the book, Gobel, The Man with the Magical Mind, because mind is disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean to tell you, that's the honest truth. It couldn't be a better title. Uh, we have three, had three, that's the first, the second one, and then the last one. Anyone else? Yes, over here. Uh, George, one of the most memorable performances that has survived that we've had a chance to see was your performance of the Milk Can Escape on Milk's television show and stage show 
uh, Houdini, The Impossible Possible. Uh, not only was it a dramatic performance of yours, but Milburn was probably more polished and more accomplished on this show than we ever saw him on television. Do you have some memories of that uh, show? Yeah, I sure do. Okay. Number one, I always thought, well, we had a milk can built, and then I thought, boy, this thing is really heavy. So we're going to do a water barrel escape. So little did I know about water barrels. Little did I know, I thought they were whiskey barrels that these people got out of. But fitting to me, I had to get a hog casing barrel. That's exactly what it was. A, case, a big barrel that they used to put hog casings in to make sausage out of. Because it. it had to be that big for me to get into it. So I had the, the barrel. We were doing it locally. We were doing it different places. And I had ducks in the backyard. And we turned the barrel over and let the ducks live in the barrel. And they, I mean, they had a nice yard, but they would go in there and just get out of the weather. So I said, well, I better clean up the backyard. So I cleaned up the backyard, took the barrel, put it in the alley, put some trash in it. The trash man was to come by on Monday. The trash man came by on Monday, took the barrel. <laughs> Tuesday, Chris called and said, I want you to be on a Houdini special doing a water barrel escape. <laughs> well, at that time, you couldn't find any more hog casing barrels because everybody could turn into these fiber containers. And man, we searched and searched and searched. And that thing, we just saw it, you know, it was like gone yesterday. But I did find another one and we took it, we went up there and all he pled, bless his heart, he was with me all the time. Like I said, a dear friend. And uh, it was not the easiest thing to do because you're actually underwater. And you're underwater for a while and there's no, the water doesn't go out. People think when you get into that barrel, you, water comes out the top and you've got air space there. Well, you don't. And when we would always put the rope under the barrel first because once you filled it with water, you couldn't move the barrel. And then there was a lid with two hasps on it. And as a matter of fact, I was doing that We'll jump back a little bit. I said my mind's going, but I did it an outdoor in front of a movie screen one time for a promotion for Houdini's movie. And they had the fire engines there to supply the light against the big screen. And the pumper was there and filled it. Well, it was a day there was going to be a, it was a hurricane. And fortunately, for like 25 minutes, the winds stopped. <clears throat> And so we got him to do the water barrel. And I would always jump up on the top of the barrel. You can see me doing that today. Mm -hmm. And I'd jump on top, stand on the side, lower myself in, have my wrists tied, go under the water, and hold my breath and tell the audience to hold their breath. Well, I got up like this. I looked down, and there are fishing worms and leaves and mud and all kind of gook in here because I didn't know that the firemen had filled it from a nearby stream, their tanker. So it wasn't like getting into some nice warm water. It was like really some, well, here you go, buddy. You know, boom, down you went, came back up and we did it. But uh, that, yeah, that was an experience. But when we did it with Chris, uh, we were a little leery. Actually, when you're in that barrel, you have to get your way out uh, well, it takes a little bit of effort to get out. It's not the easiest thing in the world. And your nose is underwater all the time until you get it up <coughs> high enough to, to breathe. And so we were going up with Chris, and they had two new assistants. And I'd never seen them before. I had nothing, and the guys were very nice, but I wasn't too sure about, I mean, I was... Uh, to be honest, I was a little uh, apprehensive about doing it. So Augie, bless his heart, climbed up in the grid. Uh, this little, this wasn't a big studio. Laid on top to make sure that everything went all right. And he was looking down the whole time that I made the escape because, uh, yeah, that well, that was it. Oh, we have one last question. Where is it? All right. Uh, 1970 in Abbots was probably the worst 
weekend I've ever spent in Magic, they had a guy that bought every illusion that uh, Abbott's ever made, and it, it, was, it was terrible. And I almost thought about not coming back the next year, but the next year, my God, with Blackstone Jr. and Goble and Arturo, and it, what a show it was. But when George Goble came out to the edge of the stage, there was a twinkle in his eyes that uh, just unbelievable. And I still see that twinkle here tonight. Yes, you want final word, don't final you? Word. All right. <laughs> Are we going to have a collection act? Yes. I've known George Goble for uh, over 60 years. Hard to believe. And he's a truly remarkable person. I'll read you just one line which I wrote for his funeral. <laughs> I wrote it uh, several years ago, but he has steadfastly refused to die. <laughs> so I'll read it to you tonight. <laughs> When God created the heavens and the earth, the angels watched in silence. When he created George Goebel, they broke into applause. <laughs> George uh, later on after the show, and he'll be at the uh, Martika table. Now, David Adams. George, we are so very pleased that you can join us this weekend. We're so very pleased. And uh, for sharing some of your favorite intimate moments in magic. It's really wonderful. And that's why we're all here. That's why we're all here. And uh, on behalf of the New England Magic Collectors Association, we have just a few things for you. Uh, I know that you have the wand of Keller, but uh, we have a wand that Tony Karpinski made um, for some of our recipients, and it's an appreciation for everything that you have done. We also have a, a plaque that reads, New England Magic Collectors Association recognizes George Goble for as many years as an illusionist and his contributions to the art of magic, the Yankee Gathering 2010. 